Welcome to AP Environmental Science. In this video, we are going to talk a little bit about human impacts on aquatic ecosystems. Now, this is going to be a long video, so please take good notes and please remember to pause the video. I'm going to try to go through things as quickly as possible. Now, first of all, I want us to remember the term range of tolerance. Now, the range of tolerance is the optimum range of conditions needed for an organism to maintain homeostasis. And any time the conditions get outside of that ideal range, that particular species is going to experience stress, lowered growth, lowered reproduction, and possibly death. Now, these range of tolerance includes conditions such as temperature, or having adequate access to shelter or the pH of water. An example here would be coral reefs. Now coral reefs have a very narrow range of tolerance and they become damaged any time the conditions get outside of that optimum range. Some of the things that are happening to move outside of that range of tolerance that are damaging coral reefs include increasing ocean temperature, which leads to coral bleaching, sediment runoff, which leads to the smothering of the corals, and destructive fishing practices, which actually break up and completely disrupt or disturb that bottom habitat where the coral reef occurs. Oil spills also impact aquatic and marine ecosystems, and they have surface impacts, subsurface impacts, and shoreline impacts. Now on the surface, this oil is going to cover the feathers and the fur and the coats of marine mammals and birds. And this oil coating is going to impact that waterproofing of the uh, organism and it's going to impact the ability for that organism to maintain its own body temperature. Now, a lot of these marine organisms are going to try and groom themselves to remove that oil from their fur. But the problem is if they inhale or ingest any of that oil, it can actually poison the organism and lead to death. Under the surface, that oil does not all rise directly to the top. So there can be these blobs of oil that are sinking down towards the ocean floor or suspended within that water column. So when uh, companies are trying to mitigate or reduce the impact of an oil spill, they have to consider the impact beyond just the surface. As this oil settles down to the bottom of the ocean, it is going to smother any of those organisms that are the bottom dwellers. Of course, again, along the shoreline, there are also impacts during oil spills. These oil blobs and that oil surface can wash up along the beaches. This is going to impact those shore dwelling organisms, along with impacting fishing and tourism industries. Nutrient pollution is associated with the biochemical oxygen demand. We've talked about nutrient pollution a little bit earlier in this course when we talked about how wastewater from livestock adds extra nutrients to a water body, and this can lead to eutrophication. This can also increase the biochemical oxygen demand. Now the biochemical oxygen demand is this demand of the bacteria and the decomposers on using oxygen found in the water during their processes of decomposing or breaking down any types of organic pollutants. So more oxygen is required for the bacteria to decompose all of this extra organic material. So a higher BOD means you have more nutrient pollution. This can lead to what's called an oxygen sag curve. And an oxygen sag curve looks at a point over a period of time. And you can also look at it as a point along a river. So what we see in this graph is the blue line representing the amount of dissolved oxygen. And in a healthy aquatic ecosystem, you want to have a lot of dissolved oxygen. 
The red line represents the biochemical oxygen demand, which is really an indirect way to measure the amount of nutrients that are in that water. What we see here is a point source pollution where a pipe is discharging some type of organic matter into that waterway. At the point where that pollution is added, we see a sudden spike in the biochemical oxygen demand. So that we're going to see a lot of decomposition happening in this location and the amount of dissolved oxygen is going to start to decline. As we get away from that point source, so over time, we are going to see that biochemical oxygen de demand start to decline, and we're going to see the dissolved oxygen start to come back up. Now this takes a fair amount of time, and if the water body spends too much time in that septic zone where we do not have very much oxygen, we are going to see large die-offs. This is very similar to what's happening in the ocean dead zones. And we see a very large ocean dead zone in that Gulf of Mexico. These are areas with low oxygen, and this is primarily caused by nutrient pollution. So what we see happening here is a high biochemical oxygen demand which means there's very little dissolved oxygen present, which means that those life forms are not able to breathe, so to speak. The way that a dead zone forms is when you have this fresh, nutrient-rich water coming out from, say, a river over the top of the ocean. Now, this fresh water is less dense than the salt water, so it creates this barrier over the top of that salt water. That salt water is no longer able to exchange oxygen with the atmosphere, and the organisms in there are going to use up all of that oxygen relatively quickly. We're also going to see a lot of decomposition of that nutrient pollution, which is going to deplete all of the remaining dissolved oxygen. As a result, nothing is able to survive because even fish are really breathing that oxygen through their gills. Another impact or threat to aquatic environments is sediment pollution, and this is also called sedimentation. These are particles of soil that are suspended in the water, and they're often associated with carrying nutrients along with them. These are typically associated with human disturbance of the land that leaves soil exposed. These could be things such as construction sites, road building, agricultural tilling, and overgrazing of the land. As a result, this increases the turbidity, which means that the sunlight is not able to penetrate through the water column, and there's a lot of suspended solids. This can also potentially lead to eutrophication from extra nutrients that are being carried along with the soil. If we have less light infiltration or less sunlight coming into the water column, the plants in that water column are not going to be able to do as much photosynthesis, so that means those plants are adding less dissolved oxygen into that water. The reduced visibility from sediment pollution also makes it difficult for predator species to find their prey species. And all of this sediment is going to disrupt the habitat of that ecosystem. So it will smother any eggs or bottom dwelling fish species, and it will clog the gills of fish, making it difficult for those fish to have that oxygen exchange to be able to breathe. Litter and plastic waste also impacts aquatic ecosystems. The source of this litter and plastic waste is always from humans. Humans are the only species on Earth that produce litter or waste. The impacts is that many species mistake this litter for food, and the litter or the plastic waste is not going to have any nutritional value. So these species are spending time trying to hunt this down, their bodies are trying to digest it, and that uses energy, but they're not getting anything in return. In fact, this plastic waste 
can actually clog their digestive system. Many of these species also die because they get tangled in that plastic waste or they're suffocated for getting that stuck into their airway passages. Additionally, if they do manage to ingest it and not get tangled and not suffocate and not have a blocked digestive system, the chemicals inside of many of those plastics actually are adding toxins to the ecosystem, which can poison those organisms. Microplastics are a special category within this um, threat. These are tiny, partially degraded plastics and fibers. So all of that plastic waste, over time as it sits out in the ocean, it's going to slowly break down into smaller and smaller pieces. But these small pieces still remain out there. They're not going to eventually dissolve. They will just become these tiny little sand-like particles. But as this plastic breaks down, not only is it releasing toxins, it is also releasing endocrine disrupting chemicals. And we will spend a whole video talking about endocrine disruptors. Plastics can also introduce pesticides and other chemicals that cling to those plastics. And when an organism tries to eat them, now they are ingesting those chemicals. The Pacific Garbage Patch is a collection of a lot of this plastic waste that is floating around in the Pacific Ocean. Now this is collecting due to these ocean gyres, which the ocean currents really just tend to collect or accumulate this in one place. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is not this big mound of garbage in the ocean. In fact, it looks like a bunch of tiny little plastic debris that are all suspended together in a certain area. You could drive a boat over it and not initially realize that you are in this garbage patch until you take a closer look at the water. Now again, this garbage patch is huge. It is larger than the countries of Germany, France, and Spain combined. Heavy metals also are released into waterways, and these are primarily coming from industry and mining. Remember, we talked about acid mine drainage releasing acids into aquatic environments. We've also talked about how the combustion of fossil fuels releases heavy metals such as mercury into the atmosphere, and this mercury can also be released into the waterways. Now, these heavy metals end up in surface waters, which impacts aquatic habitat, but it can also end up in drinking water, and that can impact humans as well. We see things such as lead, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, copper, and chromium. These are all heavy metals that are found in aquatic environments that are not normally there. Because heavy metals are dangerous, these can lead to specific health impacts such as cancers, organ damage, and neurological issues. Additionally, these heavy metals are going to bioaccumulate and biomagnify. The term bioaccumulation means that these particular substances will stay within an organism and they're not able to be excreted or shed away. Biomagnification means that any time an organism is eaten that already has any of these pollutants in there, the organism doing the eating is now also consuming all of those metals. Methyl mercury is a result of bacteria converting mercury into methyl mercury. And mercury poisoning is often associated with eating fish or other aquatic organisms that lived in environments where mercury was released. Now, mercury causes severe neurological damage and birth defects, and additionally, this is going to bioaccumulate inside the tissues of a single organism, and when that organism is then eaten by another organism higher up the food chain, it is going to biomagnify. This is why the EPA suggests that you do not consume 
any fish species that are really high on that trophic level. And that's because they're afraid that those individuals are more likely to contain dangerous levels of methylmercury. A case study of this is in Minamata, Japan in the 1950s. A factory was actually releasing or dumping waste that contained mercury into the Minamata Bay and that is where fish living in there were absorbing that through their gills and they were absorbing it through the food they were eating. Now most of the people that lived in this community got most of their protein from eating shellfish, shrimp, and fish from the bay. And what happened is that methylmercury biomagnified or moved up the food chain into those humans. And over 2,000 people were actually impacted by this. What happened in the town is that people first started noticing that cats were dancing in the street. So they were moving kind of funny. They were losing control of their muscular system. And then they collapsed and died. And this was kind of scary for the people living there because they had no idea what was happening. Then people started experiencing numbness and pain in their hands and feet. People even went blind, had tremors or shaking. They lost coordination. They become paralyzed and they experienced memory loss. And people who were born to mothers that maybe didn't have any of these symptoms, but were consuming some of that contaminated fish, those infants were born with severe developmental disabilities. So it's important that we're addressing not only the environmental issues associated with aquatic habitats and the damage humans have caused to it, but these impacts on aquatic environments also impact humans. Now in summary, and again, this was a huge amount of information. You need to be able to describe some of the ways in which human activities have impacted aquatic environments. Some of the main concepts that we discussed in this video included the range of tolerance, biochemical oxygen demand, oxygen sag curve, bioaccumulation, and biomagnification. Again, please rewatch any sections of this video that you need to take more notes on or you need clarification on. Send me your questions here, and I hope that as you watch this video, you were able to learn something.